Coming up next on Insights on PBS Hawaii, what do our young entrepreneurs see for Hawaii's future? Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Malia Maddock. Hawaii's millennial and X generations are coming into their own. Some are taking the American entrepreneurial spirit and giving it their own spin as they deal with emerging concerns in urban planning, healthy living, and sustainability. What are some of the challenges faced by Hawaii and how are these innovative future thinkers addressing them? What do our young entrepreneurs see for Hawaii's future? We invite you to join our conversation by calling, emailing, or tweeting your questions and comments. Now to our panel. Gwen Wultz is the co-founder of Wahine Media, a social media agency for businesses. She is the current president of the Social Media Club of Hawaii. Annie Hiller is the executive director of Project Vision Hawaii, a nonprofit organization that provides access to health screenings statewide in a 36-foot recreational vehicle, connecting services with the people who need them. Aubrey Yi is studying to be a futurist and is a PhD candidate at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. She also serves on the board of Kanu Hawaii, a grassroots social change nonprofit, and is the project director for the Omidyar Group's new initiative, Hawaii Quality of Life. Alan Joaquin is the founder of Farm Roof, an agricultural sustainability company based in Waimanalo. He has more than 20 years of experience in agriculture, engineering, environmental protection, and landscape construction. Welcome, everyone. Let's start our conversation today with uh, what is a millennial, what is Generation X, how do we sort of determine what these generations are, how are, how are those viewpoints formed? Aubrey, can you tell us yeah, a little so bit about that? Yeah, so it's sort of, um, it's called age cohort, so it's, it's the age that you were born into and it's usually a span of about 20 or so years of people that have had similar experiences. So it's the, the time that they grew up, it's what they were raised with, sort of big events that happened in their life that have defined them as a group, and they see the world in a certain way, so they share a similar worldview to typically. Um, so I'm a Generation X, and uh, I believe some of us here are millennials, <laughs> and we have slightly different ways of viewing the world and the way we interact with people and those sorts of things. So Generation X would be sort of born 1965 mm -hmm. to 1980, and then 80 to 2000 would be millennials, mm -hmm. and we do have everyone represented today. Yeah. Gwen, being a millennial, let's start with you. Mm -hmm. You work in social media, and of course, mm -hmm. one of the things that I read um, that Generation Y defines themselves by is the use of technology as making themselves unique. Do you see that in your work? Oh yeah, for sure, definitely. Um, Generation Y is kind of going to be defining pretty much um, how businesses are going to be operating in the future. Um, they are going to be the largest consumer group coming up and then you know, Generation Z to follow. So right now it's very important to understand um, how to connect with Generation Y, especially for businesses um, in the world of social media, right? So um, Generation Y are predominantly social media users. And um, so it's going to be very important for businesses to be able to adapt to these new environments. Um, it Interesting, I was reading that in Generation Y, not only is it technology, but uh, four in 10 have tattoos, mm -hmm. one in four have piercings, and uh, someone sort of asked, is this a look at me generation or is something else going on? Any thoughts on that? You know, I'm not necessarily convinced it's a look at me. I think it's actually, uh, Generation Y has an um, innate desire to share, right? We're all connected. I think technology has become an extension of our everyday life. So um, in that, it might not necessarily be like a kind of desire to get attention, it's a desire to share. Right, and so the, the postings of videos of, of yourself and mm -hmm. what you're doing, it's not necessarily trying to get attention, it's that there's a new definition of how we share and how we interact. Yes, so, exactly. Do you find that in, in sort of where you guys are operating in the community, do you see sort of a generational difference in how people are approaching things, Alan? Yeah, absolutely. I think the millennials are definitely narcissists um, in a good way, though. <laughs> and you know, you, you, wait a minute. You know, there, there's a there's a lot of publications actually that reference that that uh, you know millennials are narcissistic in in their patterns. But you know what? They could actually save the world because mm -hmm. they're saying, "Hey, look at me. Look what I'm doing. I'm going to do the right thing for my community, for my environment, and for my local economy. And I want to show it off. And I want to get my peers to see how cool I am. And that's really powerful mm -hmm. and it takes 
the old saying of think globally, act locally, mm -hmm. and it makes it real. And then what happens is it, it happens on a local level but goes worldwide through technology. And so it's kind of an oxymoronic situation mm -hmm. where it's like narcissism but not thinking locally but actually global impacts are happening. So it, it's, it's quite fascinating, actually, the millennials. A very productive narcissism. Absolutely. Happy, no, yeah. it's a very positive, positive approach. You know, it's, it's actually taking social responsibility to the next level. Annie, you're someone who's got an amazingly socially aware nonprofit going on. Was that thinking part of your decision making in terms of what you did? I think that it comes down to consciousness mm -hmm. and how we communicate with each other, like with the sharing. We, because we're so connected, because we're able to, with the flash of a camera, communicate with thousands of people, mm -hmm. it's important for this generation to be conscious of what they're doing, conscious of what they're presenting to the world and what they're sharing with the world. So I agree with you in that we are conscious. We are trying to make a difference and we are trying to present ourselves. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing right now in the community. We provide a number of different health screenings um, statewide. We have three, three major pro programs. We have one that provides free vision and retinal screenings. Um, to our homeless. We provide glasses and comprehensive screenings, working with community health centers and different homeless resource centers. Um, we also have the We Ahui for Health, which is a coalition of different screenings where we work with other organizations. Again, you know, that, con that consciousness, that connectivity, and try to play on different other organizations' expertise and maximize our return on investment providing, by providing a number of different health screenings in communities with access to care issues. Those, you know, in Ka'u or Lana'i or Moloka'i or even, you know, here in Kalihi. Um, so you're actually bringing it to them. Yeah, we have a mobile unit here on island that with the Young Brothers, we actually are able to ship statewide and provide our services in very rural, underserved areas for free. We've served over 10,000 people to date um, with vision and retinal screening, which is how we began with the, the idea of vision versus vision. But now we've expanded to vision because we believe we can re maximize our return on investment by working with other organizations and really collaborating. So I think, you know, with millennials, we're really collaborators. We like to work with other people. We like to connect. We like to see how, how can I work with rooftop gardens? How can I understand the future better so that I can provide service? How can social media play in to providing services? So. And Alan, speaking of the rooftop gardens, I so we've got 17 million square feet of rooftop in Honolulu. Is that mm -hmm. correct? And yeah. and you're you're working to try to change how those roofs look, huh? Can you tell us about that? Yeah. Well, you know, when you look out at the cityscape, you see a lot of wasted space that's barren, that doesn't have anything but black or or metal. Um, there's a lot of that space that could be utilized to harvest the sun for something, whether it be for energy through PV panels or to grow food uh, with rooftop farms. And what we've done is developed a system that's really lightweight to make it feasible to repurpose an existing structure to grow food. Uh, in the past, it hasn't been possible because of the weight constraints, but you know we've developed a system that we felt has um, overcome those obstacles. So it allows us to repurpose virtually any building that has adequate sun and access and water uh, to grow food. So it doesn't have to be a flat roof. It can have a slight pitch to it, you know, it not, not anything extreme or radical, but uh, most large buildings have flat roofs. So if you look at the traditional skyline of a city, it's mostly flat roofs doing nothing. And, and those flat roofs are, are actually, I shouldn't say doing nothing, they're doing something. They're reflecting solar radiation back to the atmosphere and creating an increase in the temperature around our cities. They call it urban heat island effect. And so green roofs, whether they're growing food or they're just aesthetic, are helping reduce that urban heat island effect, which are reducing the temperatures in our cities, reducing the amount of air conditioning that has to get used, which means we're lowering our carbon footprint because we're not running as much air conditioning. You know, it's absorbing storm water when it rains, so we don't have as much uh, water going into our storm water systems. Everyone remembers the Alawai disaster. Mm -hmm. What happens when we have too much impermeable pavement and rooftops when it rains heavy, our sewer systems back up and we have sewage that goes out to the ocean. That's not good. So 
Aubrey, are these generations we're talking about basically mm -hmm. having to sort of figure out some answers to the problems Definitely. that have come yeah. down the pipe? Yeah, a couple of things I was going to say. Collaboration is a key term, I think, for millennials. It really is that sense of getting out there and working with other people, not being afraid to do that. And I think um, another defining thing for millennials is they came to the job market at a time when jobs weren't really there, you know, so a lot of financial crisis happening. So they've had to be really creative and step outside of the box and really r rise to that occasion and be entrepreneurial and come up with their own solutions. And they're just primed for that sort of experience and, um, you know, coming up with things like seeing all the rooftops out there and deciding to do something about it rather than waiting for somebody else to do it for them. Would you say that the environment is a, is a primary concern? Definitely. For I think especially with, you know, climate change and all of these things kind of coming to the fore, people are realizing that this is happening and wanting to do something something about it, so really caring about those issues. Are you seeing that as a main, ish, uh, as a main theme in social media? Um, I wouldn't necessarily say it's a main theme in social media generally, but I guess definitely um, we are faced with, you know, millennials, the collaboration, you know, idea. Um, social media plays a, a huge role in that, and, and in no other time than now can social media be a tool to kind of help us, right? Mm -hmm. And I think you know, for me, we actually are working with more of the X generation to kind of bring them into the mindset of the Y generation and the collaboration and being very creative and tapping into these resources that you would have never, you know, uh, otherwise not seen, mm -hmm. right? Um, is there a sort of a lesson, though, that has to be learned in terms of social media for Generation Y in terms of um, putting things on social media that can then make finding a job or some of the adult decisions that come later a problem? And has that lesson been learned? Oh, for sure. Yes, definitely. <laughs> I mean, Depends, we've, right? we've all witnessed it. We've all seen it. We've uh -huh. all made those mistakes, right? So. Um, I think people have to understand that now everybody, every person is now a brand. Mm -hmm. Now that everybody is online, you have to consider yourself as a brand and what are you going to do with that brand. So um, converting that into what, how that can make business sense. So for every one of us here in this room, we can actually perpetuate our own business through a personal brand, mm -hmm. which is a very interesting idea. You see a lot of the Fortune 500 companies now, right? The leaders are now on Twitter, although statistics right now are only about 20 of the Fortune 500 CEOs are actually on Twitter. Um, but that trend is changing. In fact, for the future, um, you know, you're going to see a significant increase in leaders embracing the idea of putting themselves out there for the public, mm -hmm. right? Because the public really actually um, more so wants to resonate with a human versus mm -hmm. a brand. Mm -hmm. Does that mean then to be successful in this new future, you've got to give up your privacy? Not necessarily. To manage it. No, no, not at all. But you do have to be open to opening yourself up, right? So I'm kind of one of those people who I'm, um, you know, I, I am active on social media, naturally, um, but I do keep my private stuff that I want to keep private, private, and the tools actually allow me to do that. That is kind of the amazing thing about social media is with just a little bit of education, you can really control that um, and help, you know, guide, um, manage your own brand. What about the gulf then between sort of probably some of the people, Annie, that you serve in some mm -hmm. of our poorest communities for mm -hmm. whom having a computer at home or having these things, they aren't available. Does it sort of widen that, that gulf between those in the know and those not? I think that it does and it doesn't. I think that as technology becomes more available, it becomes cheaper more people are able to access technology. Mm -hmm. And it's going to become common sense to access it. But certainly there's populations that don't have the ability to access it. And it does create, I think, a rift between them. I've, you know, we work with all sorts of different people and, and just y simple things that you would think you know, some people would think was very easy is not easy for others. And so, I think that certainly there's rifts in, in the socioeconomic status of people and their accessibility to, to technology. Because really the library, the public library, might mm -hmm. be the only place that to they access. have an opportunity and those libraries have hours and days that they're not yeah, open. You have to also remember that cell phones. So you have to remember that all technology is kind of going towards that, mm -hmm. that thing that you have in your hand. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, for even Generation Y, we are now having to rethink our idea of what technology is into now what the Generation Z 
has in the palm of their hands, right? We actually actually put themselves in their footprints. So I kind of disagree a little bit in the, in the sense just because cell phones now yeah, are making everything completely accessible. Sure. Yeah, the smartphones right? are getting cheaper. It's basically yeah. reaching them on Rather how where they're communicating. But of course, not everyone is walking around with a state of the art <laughs> cell phone, right? Not necessarily. So you yeah. think you go back to texting, right? And so there's technology that's actually reverting back mm -hmm. to the old model, right? Um, there's tools out there where you can do straight text. Even with people, telemedicine, right? they're looking mm -hmm. at that at an international mm -hmm. level. I know that when I was in Nepal, texting was one of the main forms of communication and healthcare is really looking at that and mm -hmm. looking into ways where you know appointment reminders for mothers you know different education opportunities using texting so that's a really good mm -hmm. point mm -hmm. i think that um it is it is generational there is gaps in socioeconomics with it but the the train is moving Mm -hmm. and, and of course we've seen that some cities are choosing to, sup to provide cell phones to their homeless population mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. help close that gap, yeah. right, mm -hmm. that everyone will feasibly have. Let's talk about healthcare and the, some of the changes. One of the things that um, you mentioned to me earlier is, you know, in the future we might be taking care of a lot of our needs at a kiosk at a mall, that healthcare might be coming to us. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I feel like from, from the work that we've done, the model of healthcare has really gone full circle. Hundreds of years ago, doctors would go and they'd visit patients in their homes. They'd travel mil hundreds of miles to see patients when a symptom was presented and treat that symptom. Now, we are going back to that, in that patient-centered medical home model and changing environments. So roof rooftop gardens, you know, more accessibility to good food. There's kiosks in malls that you can get your blood pressure done. Our RV comes with diagnostic equipment to communities to provide our services. And it, but the services are now preventative. So that's not symptom-based, and that's kind of interesting because now people have all these tools at their fingertips for healthcare, but but they need to be empowered to actually use them, of course. So the idea is more towards it prevention rather than treating symptoms, but it's a patient-centered medical home with mm -hmm. prevention mm -hmm. and empowering people. And of course, another big health issue right now is food deserts, right, in terms of people of lower income not being able to even have the option to buy healthy mm -hmm. food. Do you see something like a rooftop garden as an in, uh, equalizer a bit in that in that issue? Could people feasibly that perhaps didn't have a rooftop but had some sort of balcony space or any type of, could we be moving towards people being able to take control of that? You know, that's a double-edged question. Um, I, I do think that urban space could be used to supplement the food supply in urban um, situations that may be considered an urban um, food desert. Um, I think there's more power, though, in, in growing food for, for the educational, the inspirational reasons. Um, there's a lot of choices that people can make every day, and they could choose to eat something unhealthy with full, full of sugar, or they could eat something that's healthy, full of protein and good carbohydrates. And I think, you know, rooftop farming does more powerful things through inspiration and education than it does through actually feeding people with the physical food. Um, one of our sayings has always been a rooftop farm is more than a farm and it grows more than food. You know, it's not just soil growing things. It's, it's inspiration, it's education, it's a way of changing your mindset and the food that comes from it is, is more of symbolism than anything else. And so um, I think if urban food deserts had more rooftop farms, the state of mind in those food deserts would change and that would change behavioral patterns and that's where the power is, more so than just the actual physical, how many pounds of food has been created from these, these rooftop farms. If children are going to a school that is it have, it has some sort of food program going on or if they're seeing this that they mm. might be able. Uh, this is an interesting comment. Um, from someone born in 1955, the younger generations want two things, popularity and less sweat for more pay. They're different from previous generations and it's frustrating when we've worked our way up from anonymous. Aubrey, any thoughts on that? Do you hear mm. things like that in terms of conflicts between generations? Um, yeah, but I don't think that that's necessarily true. I mean, I feel like the millennial generation is definitely hardworking. It's just in a different way. Um, but that is, I mean, there is the generation that came before that really was, you know, hardworking in, in the way of having to um, come out of, you know, World War II and that sort of thing and rebuild the country. So there is that real hard work ethic. But I just think the work ethic today is different, but it's still there. It's still very strong. How it's very it, entrepreneurial. How is it different? What's different in the work ethic now? Any thoughts? I'd say the settings. 
there's yeah. not a traditional workplace yeah. now. People are working in wherever in their homes, they are. In the mm -hmm. Starbucks yep. in constantly. <laughs> yeah. So you might see a lot of young people <laughs> at a coffee store. Exactly. In a but they're they're, they're working, working on their laptop. <laughs> they're working yeah. on their laptop. It just iPad. doesn't look like it. I mean you see co working space like popping up in Kakaako. That's very typical now, mm -hmm. right? Just the whole idea of what the workspace is, right? Mm -hmm. I've operated my business from day one out of my office, which is literally a desk in my bedroom. So yeah. <laughs> I mean and you know and I conduct international calls, video calls, I can mm -hmm. connect to anybody. Skype so, is amazing. Yeah, and <laughs> while raising a daughter, you know, I mean, I remember being on video calls while I was breastfeeding, you know, mm -hmm. it's just, it's, it's a different definition not video con yeah. Yeah. phone calls. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. in many ways that work never stops, you know, because we yeah. do have access to these devices at all hours, so we're working constantly on weekends, and like you're saying, you turn off your device on, was it you, it's a Saturday? Yeah, turn Saturday. Off Saturdays, Saturday, which is amazing, because yeah. that's difficult so to do. don't me on Saturday, because yeah. uh, you won't reach me. <laughs> and and the, the business climate is different, too. You know, before you could put 40 years into a company and get your gold watch at retirement and yeah. have your pension fund, those days are long gone. Yeah. You know, mergers, acquisitions, sell-offs. There's so many different things happening today in the business world that prevents you from being with the same company for your entire career. Yeah, and that's it's not an expectation anymore. It, it, it's yeah. just the world is not working that way. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's very, very different than, you know, working for Ford Motor Company back 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. Insecurity. In fact, there's an interesting statistic um, that I was reading. Um, it was only 7% of um, millennials work for Fortune 500 companies, mm -hmm. in fact, and they dominate the workforce in startup communities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that's just kind of a testament to yeah kind of where, how we want to work, right? We want to work differently. We well, I think, again, that comes back to coming to the workforce at a time when there was so much insecurity, so you just learn to embrace it and mm -hmm. run with it rather than be afraid of it. Yeah, yeah it I think the transparency asset. that the technology has brought has actually created the situation that has caused these legacy companies to fold or go away or merge because no longer can they do status quo or get away with some of the things that they were getting away with before because they're being exposed, mm -hmm. WikiLeaks, for example. And so the, the business actions of the past have been brought to light and now today are not acceptable. So some of the companies yeah. that were very successful 40, 50 years ago are no longer in business because they were exposed for doing the wrong thing. You know, they were being completely irresponsible with their actions. They weren't taking the environment or their local economies into account. They were just taking profit, return on investment, and those days are over. And so you see these huge companies folding and more startups coming out of the woodworks because there's people like millennials that say, hey, you know what, I care about my environment, I care about my community, I want to do the right thing, and I want to make a good, decent mm -hmm. living. I could do that. Mm -hmm. And people are very supportive of that. You had a more traditional, perhaps one might say stable job um, being an airline pilot. Mm -hmm. Was that part of your thinking? You know, it's, I'm, I'm, I live in a world of oxymorons, actually. It's kind of weird. Um, you know, I love flying. I love um, the, the responsibility that comes with flying. I think that uh, when I go from point A to point B safely and do my job properly, it's very satisfying to me. Um, but there's also a creative side to me that likes to innovate and be inspirational and to help um, other people achieve things that they thought maybe wasn't possible. So, um, I, I tr like to try to work on different fronts at all times. Do you worry about Hawaii's food security, Oahu's food security? Is that sort of an issue? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we import 85 to 90 percent of our food. We import 85 to 90 percent of our energy. There's a direct correlation there. Mm -hmm. We're the most dependent state in the union. It's completely unacceptable. We have year-round growing weather. We have fertile growing soil all over the state. Mm -hmm what's the problem, you know, and it, it, it needs to change. Now, can we ever be 100% sustainable? No, I don't think so, but we can do a much better job. Aside from more rooftop gardens, what would you like to see change? Well, we need to see more effort um, put into, you know, taking the ag land that we already have on the books and using it. We need more programs that incentivize farming. We need more programs to get future farmers excited about the profession, and that is happening. Um, it used to be that you were a cook and now you're a chef. There's a celebrity status now that's associated with high-end restaurants and the chefs, you know, Alan Wong, Roy Yamaguchi, right. all these people, they're celebrities and you're going to see the same thing happen with farming and that's going to be the best thing that happens for the environment. That's an interesting, I can mm -hmm. see that happening. Yeah. You're right, there is starting to, you're starting to see a consciousness of yeah. people and a, a glamorizing in Why a way. Not, in the right? right, yeah. I mean, the people who are growing the food are just as much rock stars as the people who are preparing it. Yeah. Right. And, and the smart chefs are realizing that and yeah. bringing really cool 
inspirational farmers into their hui yeah, and saying, yeah. let's do something really awesome. And I have seen that at some of the local mm -hmm. Star Chefs restaurant. It is yeah. exciting. Yeah. Uh, this is a question from Gloria in Mo'ili'ili. Uh, what role does the state play in helping entrepreneurs at the present moment? Uh, have any of you had any particular help from the state, or is there something you would like to see more of from the state? And of course, we've got a nonprofit mm -hmm. represented here. Any thoughts on that in terms of state help, or are, is this generation not looking for help from the state? The YWCA has a great program, the Patsy Mink Center for Business, that helps women leaders get off the ground and become entrepreneurs. And so that would be a private program. That was that yeah. is funded through federal, oh, but okay, for the federal. for the state, you know, funding programs like that yeah. to incentivize yeah. small business mm -hmm. yeah. and well, I think the startup community. There's a couple um, kick, um, um, funding programs mm -hmm. um, that's. Um, Got some money from the state. I'm actually not quite the one. Blue startups, maybe, possibly. Um, but there are definitely um, programs out there. I think definitely for the startup community. I think yeah. Honolulu specifically, um, or Hawaii specifically, is actually um, going to be an interesting space. I think for the startup um, mm -hmm. community in the coming years. Right? You see Kaka'ako and what's happening down there, and you know, in the spirit of collaboration and creativity, people are just anything, thinking of anything, and, and coming to fruition mm -hmm. um, in that in that startup community. So. Um, and, and Hawaii is kind of, I think, destined to be a hot spot, like the next Silicon Valley. Yes, oh, I, I think exciting. so, definitely. Uh, this is a follow-up question from Gloria. Are there any bills pending in the legislature to support or stimulate entrepreneurism in Hawaii? And of course, no one here is involved in the legislature, but do you hear any, any talk in your particular respective fields about something that's important in the ledge this session? I haven't heard anything. Yeah. Oh gosh. I'm excited about vision screening. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so that's something that, But yeah. I think it's definitely an area that needs more, more attention. Support. Anything yeah. you're following? Well, you know, I've actually taken a different vein um, in in how I see startups really prospering, prospering, and it, and it's not through government assistance or state assistance. It's through crowd uh, funding, mm -hmm. through yeah. um, collaboration. You know, I, I think. Richard Branson wrote a really good book, Screw Business as Usual, <laughs> and it's awesome reading. Um, and it's all about, you know, how can we think globally, act locally, but but be a, you know, what I consider a socio-ecopreneur, which, you know, we're putting our society, our environment, and our local economies, you know, in the foreground. And, and we're not relying on grants, we're not relying on government subsidies to be successful. If they come along, that's great, but mm -hmm. we're going to make a business model that's really sourced by our communities. And if we have good ideas that the community supports, then that should be very feasible. Mm -hmm. And so that's really what I'm trying to, to, to work with is, is how do I get you know startups, including my own startup, off the ground just using the assistance of my community and, and it, whether it's a local or global community you know versus trying to go for a government grant and that's probably yeah. with the assistance of social media exactly. right Absolutely. that's where it all loops yeah. together sure. I, mean, I think it's also one thing to say too is what's going to happen in hawaii um, you know speaking of connectivity is a, a larger connectivity with the inter international markets um, you're going to see businesses um, and the necessity to get um, into the international markets, right? We've got direct um, flights to Taipei now, mm -hmm. um, Beijing, right? Just just mm -hmm. this week, direct flight to Beijing. So we're going to have this influx of um, visitors mm -hmm. from abroad, and um, you know, it's for, especially for the hospitality industry. I think it's going to be very important to be prepared yeah. um, for that. All right, uh, a comment. Uh, it's prophetic to name the generations as X, Y, Z. Generation Z may be the last generation because we're depleting our resources. A sad thought for many of us with Generation Z children, yeah. right? So, Aubrey, you had you had raised this with me in terms of, you know, with the climate change, mm -hmm. Hawaii needs to start actually being prepared for, for possible refugees. From yeah. some, can you talk about that and migration. how that might impact what we're all seeing? Um, yeah, you know, just some of the island nations that are dealing with sea level rise on the, the forefront that are going to be dealing with people that are homeless and don't have places to go. I mean, we've been seeing it on, just on the north shore of our island where houses are being washed into the ocean and that's happening in some small island nations on a really big scale. So where are those people going to go? We're going to be one of the places that they look to. So how will we handle that influx of potential climate refugees will be interesting to see. Of course, that increase in people in Hawaii brings us to the issue that there's been a lot of talk about of development of mm -hmm. the urban core versus mm -hmm. preserving open space. A lot of younger people wanting to live in the urban core and not in suburbs, right? That's an mm -hmm. issue that we're seeing a lot of. Does that, do you keep that in mind in terms of your business, in terms of where people are wanting to live? Well, absolutely. I mean, the majority of people on this earth 
live in the urban core and that urban core can be more enjoyable, more sustainable, more green space can be present whether it's on a rooftop or in a park or in, in parking medians. Uh, I think the urban core development is really at the heart of what's going on in Kaka'ako. They're rethinking how should our communities look, how should the urban space feel and operate, and can they be sustainable, can they be inspirational? Absolutely. Um, there's a tremendous amount of resources that we can take from the urban core and, and put back into our community. Uh, and, and with the, the population growing, there's no other real choice but to keep people in very tight quarters. So we just have to be smarter about how we develop. Do you think that will impact how healthcare grows and is delivered? Certainly, it already has. Um, we've had quite a few Pacific Islander migrants um, through the COFA agreement with the federal government. And our healthcare system is already suffering quite a bit because we don't have culturally competent services, mm -hmm. we don't have enough services, there's many people without insurance, high rates of diabetes, impacts from the nuclear mm -hmm. Im impacts. So um, certainly, without a doubt, will affect healthcare. And again, it brings it back to technology. How do we address you know, this new population with this train that's moving forward with all this new technology and communication and provide good services to them and keep them healthy. Mm -hmm. and the needs. Uh, this is a comment from Anna on Neighbor Island. Entrepreneurship knows no age. Why is this panel composed of people under the age of 35 or so? I'm glad oh, that that's so sweet. Anne <laughs> thinks we're all under the age of 35. But right? at any rate, um, and maybe this is a good opportunity to sort of let people know that tonight we are talking with young entrepreneurs to get their thoughts on Hawaii's future. And we invite everyone to join our conversation by calling 973-1000 if you're on Oahu and 800-283-4847 from the neighbor islands. You can also email or tweet your questions and comments. And we do want to let Anne know we love having entrepreneurs entrepreneurs of all ages on many nights on Insights. Tonight we decided it would be interesting to take a look at what maybe this new generation was thinking about the future. So uh, this is also a comment. In prior days, pre-computers, we had to interact face to face. Mm -hmm. Now we get blisters on our fingers, not <laughs> other parts around it. Things are different from anonymous. Mm -hmm. um, is there a downside to these new bright inventions that are changing our lives? Any thoughts? Um, you know, I think it's a really interesting to kind of see that, that viewpoint, actually, because I see it the complete opposite. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, if you look back at the old business models, right, you would walk into your barber shop and your barber would know you by name and you go in and you talk story, right? Well, the same thing is actually really happening. We're, our business models are actually reverting back to those good old days of doing business where relationships are really what is going to make or break your business. So it's just coming in a little bit different forms. Now, one might also argue that social media and technology is actually bringing people together in person mm -hmm. as well, um, not just over you know, your cell phone or social networks. Um, you, know, you see tweet ups, right? The idea of the tweet up where y'all meet in person, albeit you're tweeting on your phone, but you're still connecting. And you're not only connecting with the people in the room, you're also connecting with your audience, right? at the same time. I think it's just on a much larger scale. You know, people think of relationships as being one-on-one. -on -one. Right now it's one to, the average is like 650 friends that millennials have on mm -hmm. Facebook, right? Aubrey, any thoughts on, on that issue? Yeah, it was a similar kind of a feeling. It's You're still having those face-to-face -face interactions, but you're then like amplifying it with your social network interactions. So you're not necessarily losing that face-to-face. -face. It's just being um, supplemented, I think, in many ways by social media. Annie, any thoughts in terms of, of, do you see any downside for healthcare in terms of technology or is it all good news? I think that with healthcare, it's kind of a unique position because the relationship between a provider and a patient is one where you, it's important to feel that touch, to have that eye contact. And sometimes, you know, my father has complained as a physician that he feels like he has to go like this, mm -hmm. you know, he has to type in all this information and loses that time. It's my belief that we're, the technology is here, but the people, I think that we're all catching up and we need to grow together mm -hmm. with the technology. And I think it's important to remember that there's people behind that technology and there's people with that technology and there's so many different players in that. But I think in healthcare, 
it's important to really balance both. And like what we were talking about a little earlier, remember to put down your cell phone, you know, remember to, to you know, give someone a hug. And th that touch is so important. And I pay think. attention. Yeah, there is yeah. all, the, all those etiquette, you know, that, that we have to remember. And I think it's funny because now Generation Z, right, the, <laughs> the last generation apparently, I guess, is, um, you know, they're going to have no concept of that. And so that's going to be really interesting for mm -hmm. us to have to adapt to kind of what their kind of ideas of being polite is. And I do think that's something that a lot of parents sort of ponder in terms yes, of I trying guess. to get your child away from electronics to look at the sky and, yeah. and run around on the grass. Um, in terms of sort of, Annie, to your point about healthcare, we've got this aging population not just in Hawaii but nationally and uh, is this sort of the model you see of the future of healthcare coming to people? Do we need to start thinking that way? Certainly. I think that, you know, the model of hospice is really becoming less, more and more faded out and more home care, more home visit, engaging the whole family in the process of care I think is really critical and I think that that's where we're moving. Sort of full circle back to some of the, the positives of a country doctor that came to your home sort of thing coming out. What might be sort of the interesting things that we can see in the future? I was fascinated. You told me that you can actually, in these, these screenings, alert someone to the fact that their diabetes are, is about to endanger their sight, which to me is just, it's, that's fascinating that you could go out into the community and do that. Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, when we go out to communities, we take pictures of people, the back of people's eyes. So your eye is like a camera, the front of it is like the lens and the back is the film. And this tissue in the back is very, very sensitive. I've heard surgeons say that it's like wet tissue paper. Mm. And things like diabetes, hypertension can damage this tissue permanently. But luckily, a lot of this is preventable if, and you can see it earlier on a retina. So we're able to educate people about the importance of eye care by showing them their retina and engaging them in an individualized screening to try to you know, facilitate behavior change and say, you know, hey, maybe you should control your eye diabetes. Mm -hmm. Your eyes are pretty important. Talk to them about that. Uh, you started working on golf courses, Alan. Mm -hmm. Have you had any thoughts? Is there anything, we've got so much golf course in mm -hmm. Hawaii. Is there anything we can do to sort of harvest some of that space for food production in any way, or is, is there no way to sort of get any sort of benefit? Um, I've never really thought about it. I mean, we have a lot of space that's dedicated to golf courses. We have even more space that's ag land doing nothing. Right. I think that's First more appropriate that. to, mm -hmm. to, to focus on what we have already that um, is absent the chemicals and the herbicides, and fungicides, and all the other stuff that gets used on golf courses to keep them looking pretty. Um, you know, there are a few golf courses that practice organic practices, but for the most part, you know, there is a lot of synthetic stuff that's being used out there. So it's not really the best place to grow food that's healthy and organic. Um, but I think that you're going to see more clubhouses featuring rooftop gardens, mm -hmm. more um, you know, special gardens within. The, the, the social space of golf courses that are, are more for inspiration and more for their own little small kitchen. It may not be large scale production, but it's gonna be going towards the theme of trying to be a little bit more sustainable. Mm -hmm. and, I, and you see that happening already. And that's sort of, I guess, that idea of collaboration and that often it's been environmentalist versus golf course developer. Yeah. And if you can see sort of more of the, the for-profit entities moving into helping, mm -hmm. do you think we'll see that, Aubrey? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for-profit entities moving into sustainability issues. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's happening already all over the place. People are just generally waking up to these ideas and seeing that, it, like you're saying, it's inspirational, it's fun, it's you know beyond all the other positive aspects. What are the, the biggest challenges you think are facing us? As much as there's a lot of positive yeah. uh, sort of feeling among the younger generation, is it the environmental aspect that you think um, we really- There's a lot. I mean, you know, social inequality is also big, but the environmental aspects of, um, you know, climate change is big, obviously food security is huge, fresh water is an issue that's gonna be more and more prominent. Um, there's just a lot of things coming at us and technology's changing so quickly. So I just think in general, uh, building resiliency and building people's adaptability and, and desire to be open to change and be open-minded is kind of critical for the future. What sort of adaptability do you think we are going to have to see in businesses, nonprofits? Uh, what would be some of the issues that you see coming up for businesses in terms of adaptability? I think people are going to have to, in, in the business world, are going to have to adapt to the reality that their actions are going to be 
held against them, whether it's good or bad or ugly, um, they will be held responsible for their actions. It, this is a very transpar transparent world. It's getting even more transparent, and that can work for you or against you. Um, the smart businesses are going to actually take advantage of that, leverage that, and say, look what we're doing good. Look what we're doing to, to better our communities, better our environment, better our local economies. And the bad businesses, they're going to turn their back on it, and they're, and they're, they're going to be sorry. Get really uh, paid the attention to die. on social <laughs> yeah. media. Adapt or die environment, right? It, it is, and that's actually a very good quote that came from the Department of Agriculture hmm. uh, is that what, yeah. back in the day, where yeah. when they were talking about technology advancing and, and modern agriculture mm -hmm. advancing, the, the, depart the, the head of the Department of Agriculture told the farmers, "Look, adapt or die." Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And and he was right at the time, even though big agriculture took a wrong turn. You had to adapt. You had to be a big monocrop operation to survive with the subsidies and the way they were set up. But now that whole subsidy program and the monocropping program is being deconstructed and going more towards local small scale production that's more diversified. Biodiversity is more important than monocropping. Mm -hmm. So now the adapt or die is in a different context, but it's still true. Interesting. Any thoughts on adaptability before we leave that? Yeah, sure. I mean, I guess the, the, the term that um, in the business world they're calling it digital Darwinism, and that's actually, um, I guess we can give credit to Brian Solis. He wrote a really great book, um, End of Business as Usual, and his new one is um, What's the Future of Business. Mm -hmm. um, two really great businesses, but that's kind of just a really good way to kind of sum it up. You know, digital Darwinism. Um, if if you're not willing to kind of embrace um, how people are now interacting or um, communicating with businesses or what expectations and customer service, um, then you will no longer survive. Right? There's also another really great quote: um, "The ROI of social media is that your business will exist in five years." <laughs> that was, I believe, Gary Vaynerchuk said that a few years ago. Right? And people are already seeing that. Right? The turnover is so quick if you are not so quick. I mean, the thing is, is like if you see like um, Facebook's coming up on their 10-year anniversary on February 4th. 10 years, which is stunning. I feel like they've yes. been here forever. Yeah. yeah, no, but in 10 years, when you look at any other kind of advancement in technology and how long it would take for you know just the idea of the personal computer and how long it's come in, gosh, 20, 30. I don't know how long they've been around even. Right? I'm a <laughs> I'm a Gen Y. I wouldn't know. I grew up with with computers. So. Um, yeah, it, it's that that sense of having to move forward and very, very quickly. And it used to be that an invention came along every sort of rapid pace of change. Yeah, right, and now yeah. incredibly. Uh, this is a question from Susan on Molokai, and I'm glad she asked. It's a good point. This panel is focused on urban life. I've been asking a lot of questions about urban life. Mm -hmm. What is happening to the younger generations on outer islands and in rural areas? Annie, I'd love to start with you because you are someone who is very involved in rural areas. Can you talk to us about that? Well, I have a little country in me too. My dad lives on the big island. So um, I would say that in rural areas, people are still using technology. Just thinking about my little sister, she has a phone, she texts, she's on Facebook. Um, and I think that entre I think that you, you're a country boy too. It's, it's really the same idea of collaboration and using resources. I worked on a project, a Beacon project, where we worked with different healthcare organization, hospitals, community health centers, um, Native Hawaiian health si systems, you know, different nonprofit organizations. And the idea of it was to merge with technology. But really what came out of it is for the first time these organizations were talking mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they were communicating and from that, I mean, that's a starting point. So um, I think that in rural areas, the communication is really helpful mm -hmm. um, for improving access to health care, access to healthy food, access to people. So you were mentioning that it might be possible in the future for someone to be able to sort of communicate and get their blood tested and, and get treated for diabetes from the most remote spot live with a physician. Is that already happening or is that something for the future? There are programs where there's glucometers that populate um, medical records live. So if a blood sugar is high, physicians can actually see that their patient has a high blood sugar as they test and it provides an opportunity for biofeedback. They have a log of what your blood sugar was a week ago, what's the blood sugar today. And they're doing that with blood pressure monitoring as well. Um, and I think more and more with healthcare and with I think any business, having access to this information mm -hmm. um, 
can help people, you know, being able to look a symptom up on the internet and say, see, okay, should I be concerned about this? Do I need to drive 100 miles or fly over to Oahu to get care? Um, so I think that it's definitely changing. And there are, I think technology can help, but again, you know, we have to remember the human because sometimes I think people put the cart before the horse with technology, and I think the human, the conversation comes first. It seems to me that as Oahu gets more urbanized, there's a lot more appreciation for our rural communities, our neighbor islands, food production. You know, I think people are quite thankful that we've got sort of lettuce coming from the big island, and mm -hmm. I see people at Costco flocking when that gets put out over some of the options coming from the mainland. Mm -hmm. It seems like there's a, a renewed appreciation, would you say? Absolutely, and there's a renewed opportunity for outer island residents as well. Molokai is a perfect example. I know several farmers that are doing very well in Molokai because they're taking advantage of this desire to have locally produced produce. And if it can't be on Oahu, well, Molokai is the very closest close. thing, mm -hmm. you know, next to Kauai. So they love produce from Molokai. And so there are a lot of farmers that are shipping on Young Brothers fresh produce going back to the Costco's, back to the Safeways, and, and so they've used this communication tool to go, wait, okay, I built awareness, there's a need on Oahu, I'm going to supply that need, and what's happening is they're creating a healthier environment for themselves, both physically by working out on the farm and also they're creating an income, and they're supplying a need in the urban environments for local fresh organic produce, and who's getting cut out? Big oil and the mainland farms. I think that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> of course, some areas of the United States are having a hard time keeping young people in rural areas because cities have become so attractive. Aubrey, do you think we're going to face that problem in Hawaii, or do you think we're in a different um, situation? I actually see a little different situation. I think uh, technology is allowing people to go back into rural areas, and a lot of people are choosing that because of the beauty of Hawaii, and that's why we live here, is to have access to nature a lot of times. So while, while people are coming to the cities for a lot of things, they're also choosing to move back to um, outer islands or rural parts of Oahu. I totally agree. Yeah. I, I moved up to the country as soon as I um, w knew that I didn't have to be in downtown mm -hmm. Honolulu or have an office down there because who wants to drive, you know? <laughs> yeah, and if you could do I, most of your work from your bedroom. Yeah, I mean, I, I probably drive into town three times a month, mm -hmm. you know? And I guess that's part of sort of the vision of sustainability, mm -hmm. right, is as much as we can decrease sort of the time on the, yeah. on on the, the freeways, mm -hmm. then that's what, mm -hmm. where we're going. What other trends do you see coming up in the future in your individual fields? Is there anything else that exciting that you guys are hearing of out there? Well. I, think, um, I think social media is going to revolutionize customer service. Um, and customer service is going to become um, customer experience, I think, is what businesses really need to um, change their mindset about what customer service is. Again, we're going to revert back to that old model of giving people independent attention. And only through social media have businesses even have the opportunity now, right? So um, specifically, um, if you are a brick and mortar business and you have a physical address, now there's technology such as a geotag, right? And people are um, sharing their photographs and their experiences through technology like a geotag, something so simple that you wouldn't think is there. And that opportunity is there for businesses to actually monitor that geotag and go and talk to somebody um, over the internet where you're not even face to face. Um, and so I think those missed opportunities are going to be instrumental in really um, setting yourself apart from the competition. Customer service is going to be very, very important. Can that be a burden to some businesses to have to monitor and police what's being said and what people's opinions? I mean, is there a bit of a downside to that as well? Oh, never. I, well, not at all, because it's, I mean... It's becoming so automatic in many ways. It is, I mean. and, and you find that actually, you know, businesses who embrace um, and focus their attention more on customer service are actually finding they're making more money, mm -hmm. you know, um, because people who are happy about a product are more likely to share their happy experience versus their not-so-happy experience, right? And specifically, the people who are sharing these experiences are people who have um, a lot of um, a larger community because they understand the environment, right? So, um, you know, somebody who has maybe even, you know, thousands of followers is more likely to share and engage with other brands. In fact, millennials are actually more likely to follow a brand over friends and family on Facebook right now. People want to connect with brands more than ever. And so it's going to be up to them to really kind of embrace that and seize that opportunity. So the opting out of Facebook, which I have friends and, um, 
who just, it's not for them, and nor is, is sort of Twitter or the rest of it. Is that even going to be a choice in the future, or are you going to be sort of a dinosaur if you take not that necessarily. path? Not necessarily. I don't think, the, the one thing that's always gonna, that's always gonna stay the same is people's um, fundamental desire to connect. And that's never gonna change whether it's a brand or another, another human being. So the expectation always, is always gonna be that a brand will treat you like a human being. So you know whether you opt out of Facebook you know, or, or not, I mean, you probably will be a little bit lonely, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. In the future. I mean, <laughs> who knows? I saw my mom post a picture of her um, meal the other day, and I was like <laughs> shocked. I was like, holy moly. <laughs> oh, that's so cute. Uh, Avi, what are, in the futures community, what are people talking about? Yeah, I was going to say, we, we talk about some of the more out there wacky things. So um, some of the things we talk about a lot is 3D printing mm -hmm. is going to be really revolutionary, I think, especially for a place like Hawaii that, um, you know, as manufacturing changes and things become possible to do in your own home, that's going to be a big deal for us here. Um, driverless cars has the potential to really revolutionize the way we travel here on the islands. The drones that are coming, we're going to be a testing site for that. That's going to be a big change. You think Hawaii will be? A it is. It was one of the places that was selected in the country. Um, they're trying to, you know, roll out more drones as of 2015. There's a big plan, and Hawaii is one of the testing sites for that. So we're going to see a lot of activity around that, and that'll change a lot of different things. So some busy skies. Huh? <laughs> yeah. This is a question for Alan regarding rooftop gardens. There was a time when they were considering a rooftop garden at the state capitol. Is this <clears throat> still being planned? And where do you need help in getting your project farm roof more? widely accepted from Nancy? Oh, there you go. That's it's really a great happy. question. <laughs> um, Governor Abercrombie is very passionate about getting a rooftop farming system on the Capitol and the holdup right now or I guess you could say the hurdle is from the State Historic um, Preservation mm -hmm. Council. Mm -hmm. They're saying that it need that the, the State Capitol needs to be preserved uh, and not changed um, in, in a way that would, would not be in accordance to the rules and regulations. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's the sticking point right now is if they could actually take planters that have an alpaca and weeds and other things growing in it and actually grow food in them, if that would be a, a violation of the state historic preservation Interesting. rules. Interesting. That's the sticking point. Huh. It really is. It's not the load-bearing capacity of the roof. Um, I've actually testifi des testified about you know the, the feasibility of putting a, a rooftop farm in the Capitol. I think it would be incredible for our lawmakers mm -hmm. to have a rooftop farm above their heads and, and participate in a community-supported agriculture project mm -hmm. that gives them fresh produce that's grown literally above their heads. Because the next time they see a bill come across their desk that references healthy, sustainable living, urban agriculture, or rural development for ag, they're going to look at it through a lens. And think about it. So that's, that's an different. issue before the legislature then yeah. that is, yeah. a, is a key one. Mm -hmm. um, but Abercrombie is very passionate about it and, and I, I really support um, you know his view on, on trying to push it through so he's working through that. All right we're in our final minutes but let me get some of these comments and questions in. Sylvia, yes digital divide is alive and well but no need PC at home as Gwen noted mobile devices are closing the gap so a lot of agreement there. Bert, I love what Ellen Joaquin said let's have rock star farmers. <laughs> Bert likes that. In, so in our final Farmers moment, are rock stars. <laughs> absolutely just more more media for them. So in our final moments let's let's go around and share a little bit in terms of We've talked about what we, we see happening. What do you hope we will, might not be happening yet, but what are you hoping, what should we be doing in sort of the next five and ten to ten years? Ellen. Let thy food be thy medicine. Mm -hmm. You know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. It, it, you know, the diabetes and the vision problems are all systematic issues that have to do with how we eat and how we live. So let, let's eat healthy, let's be healthy, let's be more active, and let's take technology and use it to, to, to move that part of our lives forward. And try to sort of close that income gap for people for whom eating healthy is a is a challenge. Yeah, well, you could actually make a living off of growing premium microgreens, and now you have an income revenue stream that's coming to you as well as healthy food. So mm -hmm. it's just thinking outside the box. There's many ways to skin a cat. All right. Uh, Annie, your thoughts. What should we be doing? I completely agree. It's all about prevention and collaboration and trying to work with other organizations to to rule out diabetes, rule out vision care. You know, I wish we didn't even need a vision van to try to detect blindness causing diseases. Um, but I think that as we grow, as 
as healthcare changes, there'll be more communication and more inclusion of different sectors, healthy eating, you know, social workers, building teams in healthcare to help people grow. And maybe it's not even called healthcare anymore. Maybe it's just called Lifestyle, Help, management. lifestyle <laughs> that management, exactly. So, you know, all these working parts playing together for better quality of life. All right. Aubrey, what should we be doing? Um, I'd say cultivating leadership and cultivating successful collaboration is critical because there is so much passion here. And in Hawaii, people really love this place. I think um, they're ready to help and want to do what they can. So how do we unleash that as much as possible? All right, Gwen. Yeah, I mean, definitely, obviously, the common thread here is collaboration, and we're all, you know, this generation is so willing and so wanting to collaborate, so that's very important. Um, my hopes for, you know, at least the social media environment is that businesses will really embrace um, kind of what the real value is and what the real opportunity is, and um, that's going to take kind of um, putting social media and integrating it a little bit more um, into your business where it doesn't just fall under marketing or it's not a bonus skill set of somebody else, but really where you use social media as a tool to help inform your business, to get feedback, right, to help you through the HR process, to help you with your marketing, to help you with your community outreach. Um, that's the potential. And hopefully sort of that, that connectivity in terms of helping nonprofits as well, maybe businesses exactly. reaching out to them. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. I learned so much during this hour. Very, very inspiring yeah, stuff. Thank you. Well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Next time on Insights, we will have all four county mayors here at our table to discuss their community's concerns and what they hope to achieve from the state legislature. On the next Insights, a conversation with our four mayors. What is the state of Hawaii's counties? That's next Thursday on Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Malia Maddock, Ahuiho.